here at NoSQL Now 2013. The focus of our panel today is going to be on enterprise NoSQL. Getting NoSQL into the enterprise, what's it going to take? So we'll look at that, we'll look at what's next in the environment. I'm William McKnight from McKnight Consulting Group. I'll be your moderator and I'm loud so I'll move that down. Uh, we have three panelists here today. I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Dave, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, my name Use the microphone, please. Rosenthal, Dave Rosenthal, one of the co-founders and engineers at FoundationDB. Which launched this week? Which launched yesterday in this room? Uh, my name is Dave Rubin, and I'm the director of uh, development for the Oracle NoSQL database group. I'm Pete Avon. I'm a senior engineer at MarkLogic. Great. Okay. So uh, I'm going to ask them some questions. We're going to try to get answers from all of them on the questions. And uh, as we get towards the end, I'll ask you all if you have some questions for, the, for them. So be thinking of your questions as well. But I'll start with something really simple. Um, Cloudera CEO Mike Olson made some bold comments recently, Vindy, about Hadoop replacing ETL in the data warehouse. So my question for the panelists, start with Dave here, do you agree? I guess absolutely, I do agree. Um, I, I don't know how bold a statement that is. I think, I think Hadoop is definitely replacing the traditional data warehouse, and I talk to people every day who are thinking about replacing their data warehouse with a Hadoop cluster. I was talking with somebody earlier who said there was sort of an air, in, an air of inevitability about Hadoop, and I said, I think you said it just right. Like, nobody's using it yet, but you know, when you ask somebody if they think they're probably going to be using it, they all say yes. Um, in terms of ETL tools, I, I think there'll still be ETL tools. E ETL is a, is a batch processing function. I see somebody building that on top of Hadoop, sort of is a, is a piece of, on top of the Hadoop stack. I don't know if Hadoop replaces ETL tools, but uh, that's my quick take. Dave? Uh, so I, I disagree a bit. So um, I think there's a, a, a really interesting place in the space for Hadoop, and it's, in my view, it's, it's all about scale. <clears throat> and so uh, prior to Oracle, I actually built a, a big data system in online advertising. And um, when you're asked to run a simple query like select count distinct, you know, group by month, over 400, 500, 700 terabytes of data, um, Hadoop is your only answer. Uh, but there are other requirements that the business asks you to do, like can I, can I get real-time reporting, you know, for, uh, for our users? They want to know revenue, they want to know how campaigns are performing, they want to know what audience segments are performing and not. Um, Hadoop cannot do interactive reporting today. <clears throat> so, you know, down the road, maybe, you know, interactive, you know, query at scale, ad hoc query at scale with the advent of maybe Impala, Dremel, those things look interesting. But today, um, I believe Hadoop has an interesting place, uh, but not replacing the data warehouse. Yeah, I'm. I'm. Uh, I think there's a place with ETL, maybe, and flexibility with the information with Hadoop, and maybe that's the vision for Hadoop. But you're going to need a database to manage millions and billions of objects, and when you're working with a more operational store, um, you're going to want a database. You want to be able to drill down and look at that information and validate, right? What what data is driving the decisions you're making? Hadoop's Hadoop's not there, right? It's a it's a distributed file system with a compute layer. There's some some flexibility, but but um. I'm not, I'm not quite sure. It's, it's, it's a bold statement, but it's a bold vision, and maybe they'll get there, but it's, it's not there yet. There we go. Okay, so guys, we've been through data revolutions before. Walmart had their first terabyte database 20 years ago, first one. So why is NoSQL any different from, uh, from these revolutions, Dave, from Oracle? Oracle Dave? Just leave Hello? It there's an eventual consistency problem. Um, I don't think it is different. Um, like, <clears throat> excuse me, like many other technologies, um, uh, some things are um, driven out of pure necessity. Um, NoSQL was driven out of the necessity to solve problems at scale, um, basically in the online advertising, you know, either search or online display, um, where no other solution could actually solve that problem. Um, I think it's growing in acceptance and um, 
you know, widening its scope to different industries, but I think the, the problem domain remains very similar. Okay. Uh, Dave, repeat anything? Are you assuming those data revolutions succeeded or failed? I, I, I didn't way. know if it was skeptical. No, no. no. <laughs> yeah, so I think that the thing that's driving NoSQL is two big things. Uh, number one, the economics of traditional databases. And number two, being able to scale up data to, to huge, huge sizes. And I, I, that's, that's not a revolution that's, I don't think, that it's turning around. Uh, so I think, I think we're on a, on a path, a long path with it. Yeah, I don't think it's a revolution so much as an evolution. The, uh, you know, what we see a lot of is there's a lot of the whole story about 80% of the world's data is unstructured, and now that number is growing, right? In this network world, the amount of information that's just drastically, the velocity and the volume is just ridiculous, right? And it's about gaining insight and driving decisions from that data and being able to handle that data, and you can't quickly get it into rows and columns, right? And the tools don't exist for that, and you want, and you want flexibility in your models, and you want flexibility in your system to be able to ingest that information and start doing something with it. And, um, and this has been going on for a while, right? Mongo started out a double click. People actually were trying to solve these problems, and they couldn't solve them with rows and columns. They couldn't do it with a scale-up solution. They needed a scale-out solution. And so I think about that also with terms of Mark Logic. I mean, we've been doing this. We started solving these problems like 10 years ago, right? It was when Mark Logic was founded. A couple years after that was the first release in solving these types of problems that don't fit well in the rows and columns, more unstructured information, giving it some semi-structured information. Um, yeah, so I think it's an evolution. So obviously the questions are coming from the perspective of what exists in the enterprise today, which is a lot of rows and columns, a lot of tables. But I think you started to answer my next question. If you want to hold that mic, why now? What forces have created our current data-rich environment and the tools now available to process, share, and analyze all this information? Why now? Why not? <laughs> it's an evolution, well, I think it's, right? It's the evolution, but I think now you have this, it's, it's kind of exciting to see that everything is happening with all these different databases, and, uh, but basically people have been struggling to do something with this information have not been able to and they've hit the wall, and so now they're exploring yeah. alternatives. And people are, by, are driven by necessity, like David mentioned. It's not something like, oh, let's create some whizzy bang new technology. They're actually trying to leverage the data they have they're not able to use today. And so there's different, depending on what problems you're trying to solve, you know, it's more like right tool, right job. Because in the NoSQL space, under that umbrella, there's quite, a diff, quite an array of different technologies, right, from key value store to a document-oriented database like MarkLogic to et cetera, you know. Yeah. And so, um, so it's not just like, oh, no, SQL is this one size fits all type solution. It's what problem are you trying to solve, right? And so, and people are trying to solve those problems. And what we see at MarkLogic, it's all about the, um, you have your operational data, but now more and more, it's, I have this world of information. If I'm gonna have data-driven decisions, I wanna be able to take in those external data sources and marry that with my operational data to be able to do more with the data that I have. And, in the, and within the data I have, I have, I have, I'm sitting on content that I don't even know what's there. I want to look at that, and then I also want to pull in these external sources and start to remix and analyze, and, and so that's, I think that's where we're at. Okay. Dave, I don't know if I sort of... <clears throat> so um, I, I think there are a few things going on um, really converging. So, <clears throat> you know, in the last few years, you've had enough compute, uh, sheer compute power to realize things like machine learning and classification, predictive analytics. <clears throat> so people have come up with interesting algorithms to analyze unstructured data where that, that ki those kind of algorithms could not really be computed on hardware 10 years ago, right? So that's going on. So being able to take in an unstructured stream of text like a Twitter feed, you know, a fire hose, open that up. Uh, if you're a financial services guy, do sentiment analysis on that text and understand what's going on from a macroeconomic perspective you know, wasn't, you couldn't even contemplate doing that, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago. So I think that's going on. I think um, the other piece is that people have looked at, um, looked at these schemaless types of uh, stores and have found uh, great use for them. They actually support, um, uh, you know, agile development, which, you know, depending on how you look at it, could be a beautiful thing or it may not be a beautiful thing. Uh, but clearly, the ability to be able to, um, you know, uh, model your, your store for your application <clears throat> or change it very quickly without going through that very, very painful, you know, uh, relational uh, modeling exercise, whether it's, you know, a star schema or a normalized model, um, it's, it's painful. So there's that going on. And I think, um, you know, there's a lot more solutions out there in the market today. 
Um, and so people are just looking at, at, at these things out there and they're making a choice in terms of what problem they're trying to solve. But I think you have a number of different things converging. Okay, all right. If you like. No, no, let's, let's pass, go to the next one. Okay, let's do it. very well. Uh, so let's look forward a little bit now. So we've heard about some of the use cases of NoSQL here this week. What are some aspirational use cases of NoSQL for the enterprise that we may or may not be thinking about that we probably should be in our enterprises? So I've been trying to figure out at this conference whether NoSQL includes analytics or is mostly focused around operation or whether it sort of implies operational or not. I still don't know. Maybe you, somebody can tell me after this if they've figured it out. But I think the obvious aspirational use case for the analytics side of the equation is the real-time analytics. And it, sort of what you're getting into is the limitations of Hadoop. Hadoop is a batch system. Uh, I hear people about trying to like micro batch Hadoop, get that batch runtime down to 10 minutes or something. It just sounds ridiculous, right? So I don't know how it's going to happen. I think you gave a couple of examples of companies that are pursuing that. But the, I think the real aspirational analytics use case is getting to that real time goal. I think in terms of the operational stores, uh, to me, the aspiration is, is to try to be able to actually consolidate the many disparate NoSQL databases and to some extent, eventually, traditional databases that companies are now using down into one engine. And I talk to companies every day that don't just have one NoSQL database. They have four or five or six. They've adopted all of these databases, each one providing them a different data model. But I think a lot of them have an aspiration not to have to operate and run six databases to get that capability for their developers. Okay. Anybody else? Go ahead, Dave. So I'm, <clears throat> I'm going to give you two answers. One is a selfish answer, and it's something I've been wanting for years, and that is um, uh, search over the enterprise um, repository of unstructured data. You know, whether that's PDF, Word, source control system, I want to know, give me everything that has to do with network latency that we've done, you know, in the last year. Um, I can't answer that question today. I'd be surprised if, if any of you could answer that question um, in the data that you have in your enterprise today. It's all unstructured, it's all raw text, um, and it's all basically unsearchable. So that's one thing I'd like to see. Um, I think um, ultimately um, when you look at, at, at real useful use cases, um, I think really ad hoc query at scale um, is probably, you know, is, is the holy grail uh, of where NoSQL is going. Aspirational use cases? Yes, yeah, so aspirational is kind of interesting because MarkLogic, we do have search at scale over this unstructured information. And MarkLogic, we're, we're investing heavily in semantics. And that's not just because we think semantics is cool. That's actually what people are asking for. It turns out there's facts within the data, there's facts about the data, and there's the facts of the world. And if I can take my unstructured data, throw it into a repository, and do this search over petabytes of information, but then I can model relationships among that data, what kind of new powerful searches are going to help me to make those data-driven decisions in my enterprise? And so, um, so that's something we're very excited about, as well as the real-time analytics. And so aspirational use cases, I think, are also getting tools on top of uh, the NoSQL. A lot of the NoSQL stuff that's out there is very infrastructure-y right now, right? And um, your typical, your, your standard BI tools are still bolt-ons to a relational model. And so like Tableau, Cognos, and some others have started to make, you know, um, strides in, in converting their applications on top of NoSQL repositories, which is very exciting. Um, their first pass, I noticed with one, you know, when you have a real-time repository, but you have some single client memory-bound application <laughs> that basically takes that information and you're looking at a static view, keeping those applications in sync takes a little update on the, on the part of those applications, mm -hmm. right? So. So um, I like the real-time analytics as well as the uh, okay. semantics. Okay, there we go. There's some good categories there. Now, <clears throat> we know that it's, it's hard to replace something that's in place and working in the organization, but are there any, uh, any cases inside of organizations that are using traditional data management infrastructure that you see moving whole scale to NoSQL in the next few years? Start with uh, Dave from Oracle, if you have anything. <laughs> I didn't catch it. Um, all right, so um, I think there's a, there's a couple of things where, um, or a couple of use cases where, where people are moving existing, you know, functionality or, or, or 
business solutions. And um, you know, it's it's around um, you know storing of image data. So you know, when you look at applications, for example, in you know security, people that are doing you know image recognition, fingerprint, you know, facial recognition. Um, there's metadata associated with that data that they clearly want to be able to look up very, very quickly. Uh, but really all you're doing is, is you're doing a get using some metadata attributes um, and you get back a blob and you deserialize it, you do whatever it is you're going to do with it, <clears throat> and then you're, you're doing a simple put. So, so there are cases like that where we see people getting interested in, in using NoSQL to do that kind of stuff, especially when they're looking at you know, doing scale out. Okay. Peter Day. Yeah, I, I'm going to say that I, I see this all the time, and maybe it's just by virtue of the people that come and talk to us, but every week I talk to people that are considering replacing an existing database infrastructure with NoSQL databases, Ab absolutely. Mm. Um, somebody once came to me and said, well, isn't this kind of thing only going to happen when somebody's re-architecting their whole software, because isn't that a big transition? And I sort of said, well, how often do you think a product needs to be re-architected? every five or 10 years, something like that, to stay relevant? And how long does the re-architecture of a 10-year-old product take? A couple years, <laughs> right? So by my math, at any given time, probably about 20 or 30% of all the software projects in the world are being re-architected, right? And that's a lot of opportunities for people to think about their data infrastructure. And from my perspective of the people that I talk to, virtually 100% of developers are considering NoSQL is at least part of the infrastructure for their next generation application. Good point. Pete, anything? Um, yeah, I don't think rows and columns are going anywhere, and so maybe it's just the playgrounds that I exist in that I see as um, it's more augmenting that structural, what exists in the operational structured world with the unstructured, and um, basically uh, augmenting those systems gracefully and providing interfaces for developers to quickly like the agility, basically adapt and integrate with those systems. Um, it depends on the use case, but I, I, I by no means think that NoSQL is a rip and replace for existing relational databases, okay. right? And so uh, it depends on, on, the, on, the, well, on the use case and the particular NoSQL being considered. Um, uh, but generally, um, there's a reason why those rows and columns, if it works well in rows and columns, keep it by all means in rows and columns. <laughs> but if you know, NoSQL is here to solve the problems that you aren't able to solve with those traditional technologies. So if we're talking about the enterprise, we have to talk about IT. So uh, where are these budget dollars coming from for NoSQL? Are they coming from the business or are they coming from IT? And uh, just how are we dealing with, with IT in organizations that are fairly entrenched with their SQL? Pete, you want to start with that? Oh, it's the uh, who's driving these decisions and, yeah. and dealing yeah. with IT. Okay. Dealing with IT. So uh, driving these decisions, I think it depends on the vertical. You know, I think uh, we see um, um, definitely technology, the IT is the early adopters, and the technology is driving business decisions, and we see IT uh, more embracing these technologies, and then they're delivering that message up to, you know, the, uh, the C-suite, who's then calling, you know, wants to know more about this, this information, you know, about these new technologies. Uh, but, the, but the purchasing is coming from the business. You gotta be able to show you prov provide value, really, you know? Are you solving the problem? And if, even if I solve the problem, what's, what's the actual business value? We need, you need to be able to measure that. And if you can do that, right, then, 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 then the purchase will come, right? That that, that technology is worthy. Um, um, yeah, but then, you know, but, 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 but it's not so much with IT, I was just trying to think about IT. Um, like I said, they're, they're driving these because they're exploring these two technologies to solve these problems for the business that they, they're not able to solve today. Central IT? Central IT. Okay. Yeah. So well, that's what I see. You know, but then, so that's like in Hollywood, that's what we see some of our customers in Hollywood IT is really pushing the adoption of, of these new technologies, yeah. right? And then in others, like in research or information publishing, that's where more of the business Right, is more familiar in making, making the decisions with regards to the NoSQL solutions mm -hmm. that we see at Mark, at least that's what I see at Mark Logic. How about you guys? You know, it's interesting. If you would have asked me that, <clears throat> excuse me, a year ago, I would have said it's driven by the developers um, who are getting, you know, annihilated by the business guys who are saying, you know, 
I need to know, you know, the unique users coming to my site, you know, every month that are, you know, male, uh, 18 to 24 that are interested in, you know, sports. Um, and the developers are looking at that question and trying to answer that, you know, over many hundreds of terabytes of data and are driving the, the decisions to buy the technology um, so they can actually meet the needs of the business. <clears throat> so roll the clock forward. Now we're actually seeing, uh, you know, people at the CTO and CIO level that are basically saying to their development groups, you know, go out and figure out how you're going to use NoSQL. Um, so what we're still seeing it being driven from the development folks who actually argue for the budget to solve the business problem, but we're now we're also seeing it uh, from the C-level folks who are saying, you know, go figure out how to use this kind of stuff. Solution in search of a problem, then. So I, the money is an interesting question, but it, money often follows pain, and companies are willing to get rid of pain with money. And the pattern that I see a lot is that developers are really eager to adopt and work with NoSQL databases. It's, it's an exciting thing for them. And oftentimes, instead of trying to figure out sort of the way to integrate some existing, some new functionality into their existing data infrastructure, it seems easier to download and try this tool that, you know, is going to give them a task queue and only has seven API calls in the whole library, right? Now, the problem is that you can download and learn 90% about a NoSQL database in a weekend in terms of the API, but you definitely cannot learn 90% about how to operate one in production in a weekend. So, the pain comes from the operation side. <laughs> from the ops, people are left sort of holding the other end of this decision to adopt these NoSQL databases. And from my experience, the money flows from that. OK. Very good. Um, all right. So uh, in my talk this morning, I talked about some of the enablers of NoSQL in these enterprises. I talked about you know, cloud computing being accepted and having a strategy open source being embraced and, and, and accepted into the organization. What else? Uh, I talked about data governance a little bit, but what are some of the things that organizations need to be doing? What, what sort of investments do they need to make in order to embrace NoSQL? I mean, like you said, you can just go out and download it, but how does that work its way into the enterprise and then into production? What are some of the things that, that should be in place? Anybody? So I would say the probably one of the most important things is um, you got to give your developers uh, time to get their hands on a NoSQL solution um, so they can really understand what it's good for. There are trade-offs in every single development decision you make, right? If you're a developer, you know, every day you, you, you sit down to write some code and, and, you know, a good chunk of your time is, is in figuring out what the trade-offs are in what you're going to do. Um, and like anything else, you know, uh, using a NoSQL database has specific trade-offs. And so um, if you dive into a project and you get, you know, three quarters of the way into developing a solution and you figure out, um, wow, um, you know, I'm building a financial solution and eventual consistency isn't going to cut it, um, you know, you're in big trouble. So I, I would say that is the most important thing, really understand what it is you're doing and allow the developers to get their hands on these things so they can figure it out. Do, do you think ultimately the, the, the rules that apply to what enterprises are accepting today will continue to apply to NoSQL? Like governance, you need governance, you need return on investment, you need these sorts of things? <clears throat> well, you know, I, it, as it, it's really hard to make a general statement on that, right? So there are different parts of the business that require different, different levels of governance, right? Um, you know, if you're, if you're building a, you know, uh, a credit card processing application and you have PCI standards, um, you know, that's, that's a different thing than building a solution that's going to take, uh, you know, open up a Twitter fire hose and compute sentiment analysis. So, yeah, really, it's, it has to be looked at case by case. Pete, you want to come in on this? Yeah, what was, what was the, the question, though? Was the, what's the, uh, the investment? What investments should an organization be, have, have already made in order to more fully embrace NoSQL into their environment? Yeah, because what came to mind for me was, like, awareness. I don't know. If, you know, it's more like uh, 
people, what we, what I tend to see is people see the world through a certain pair of glasses, and that's a relational scale-up pair of glasses with certain tools. And so this awareness that there's a new set of tools that can actually solve the problems that they're trying to solve, and some that are in production, actually, those, some of those problems that they're trying to solve have been solved. Um, you know, it's, it's a lot of great stuff here. One of the aspirational cases, just real quick, was a, was a cloud, which I, which I didn't even think about. And then, um, and then greenfield development is always wonderful for a developer, because <laughs> when you're entrenched in IT and you've got this legacy system built over 20 years, and your job is to modify it, it's a huge pain, right? So to go play with a new technology for a weekend is fun and all. But it gets back to awareness and, and business value, right? That's the driver. It's, it's not like, hey, cool, you played with this new technology over the weekend. How is that going to add to our bottom line, right? Yeah, How is exactly. that going to help us? How, how is that going to help us to extract information out of here and, and drive our you know, business decisions? Or you know, how can we leverage that data to, to um, you know, are we leaving money on the table by, by losing that information? Will our algorithms that we have be better if we, if we stop dropping um, you know, certain feeds on the floor because we just can't model them fast enough to get into our relational database, right? So everyone's wondering, did I lose? So uh, I saw <laughs> D Dave, um, you want to come in on that one? Sure. I'll <laughs> so I, I'm thinking about what these guys are saying, and I'm actually still sort of formulating an answer. Investments are, the investment question is a really tricky question. What do you invest in? I, I'll tell you one thing that I see people investing a lot in, and that's, that's benchmarking. <laughs> okay, I see a lot of people spending a lot of time benchmarking different NoSQL systems. And from my personal experience, the benchmarks are usually wrong, and they're usually not very useful, especially to the actual applicability of the business. So I wish I could tell you what to invest in, but one thing that you might want to think about not investing as much in is doing benchmarks. Because <laughs> a lot of people that I talk to spend a lot of time doing that. Um, and from my perspective, it's of dubious value. It sort of relegates of it all to um, total cost of ownership where you're, you're just looking for the lowest cost. Yeah, it's, it's one of these things where NoSQL databases, it's a new market. There's a huge number of dimensions of differentiation among the products. And so it's easy to sort of latch on to some things that you can measure about them, because everybody loves numbers. But I think I like what you said a lot about investing and learning about the systems and not trying to sort of boil it down into this one's 10,000 or this one's 20,000. Right, right. OK, so how about uh, tools and products? We've been talking about sort of the demand side. What about the supply side, where you guys are? What, what newer tools or products do you see as having the most impact on the NoSQL ecosystem? And it can be your own, I suppose. It's, it's our own. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, you could go ahead. I'll think about something else. <laughs> <clears throat> Um, I would say um, uh, supporting um, or getting closer to supporting something like you know ANSI SQL. So, um, so really today most of the NoSQL products are API driven, <clears throat> which is great. Right. You know that typical workload of you know I got to get data in as fast as possible with you know single digit or double digit millisecond latencies, and I got to scale that thing out is really wonderful. Um, now you start collecting data. The first thing the business asks you is, you know, can you? I, I need some aggregation. I need to answer some questions. I need to start analyzing the data along these three different dimensions, aggregated by this time frame. Um, and so I think probably the most productive thing we can see on the side of the tools is some sort of structured query language. Um, and I think, you know, the the, the juries come in. Um, and the you know the verdict is SQL. Um, you can see this you know at uh, at, at Google with uh, BigQuery and Spanner. You can see it with Impala, uh, Dremel, <clears throat> and so um, you know I, I think that's probably going to be the the biggest productivity gain on the tool side. I know it's not a tool, um, but of course once you have SQL, you can take all the tools that live on top of SQL today. And now you've now your world is is widely different. So do we have to rename our industry once we get to see? Well, I you know I, I think it's inevitable, really. Um, <laughs> you know, unless somebody out there can come up with a better um, query language, um, and I think there's no mystery why SQL has been so successful for the last I don't know 20 to 30 years. 
you know, um, there was an uh, object database initiative, I think, in the late 80s, early 90s to try to, you know, to try to topple that. Um, it failed for one reason or another, but I just, it's hard to see another query language that's really going to become as popular as, mm -hmm. as SQL. I mean, look at Hive, right? <clears throat> You know, why did the Facebook guys actually put a SQL processor on top of Hadoop, right? Because just people want to talk SQL. It's you know, it's what they it's it's what they know how to do. It's a it's it's quite a nice language for doing you know the different aggregations and you know data access that you want to do. So Pete, Dave, Dave says SQL. What do you say? Well, I was thinking agility. Uh, you want multiple. I think for NoSQL systems, there's a benefit to having multiple points of entry into your data. Um, there's something to be said for standards, definitely, and so, um, but right tool, right job. We, we are a document database for, you know, we're a database for trees, essentially hierarchical information. We model that information in XML, so we support XQuery. We also support SQL. SQL is a wonderful language for rows and columns or structured type information. Um, these higher level REST APIs, though, there's something to that too. For, for when you go into an IT organization um, and people are used to pro programming in a procedural language like Java, .NET, um, you know, usually you embed SQL inside one of these languages, um, and then you ask them to learn something functional like XQuery, that's a mental leap. It's also a new tool set, right? So in the enterprise, um, it's all about making information as actionable and operational as quickly as possible. So we, we tend to want to, you want to give people the interfaces for the languages and the idioms that they're currently, the tools they're currently using. And so in having those, those types of interfaces, I think, is uh, there's something that's, that's very useful. Um, but like, uh, you know, there's something to be said for having that SQL interface, because like with MarkLogic, we can put Tableau, we can put Cognos, we can put Excel, anything with an ODBC driver now can connect to MarkLogic. But, the, you know, there is a lack of, a dearth of lack of, <laughs> you know, a lack of applications for NoSQL databases, because we're doing something different. It's no longer rows and columns, it's structured and unstructured, right? And what's that, I don't know what the killer app is. Generally in the enterprise, everyone has a definition, different definition of what that app is, and so all apps are pretty much custom built. So then it becomes, well, how, how quickly can you custom build that application on top of this NoSQL system? How, how quickly can we get to where we want to be? Um, and what's the level of investment, right? But, um, so there's probably a wide range of tools and apps. Um, so far, it's been on the infrastructure and also building, you know, I think Dave mentioned tool for, um, for ops, you know, tools around monitoring and, and, and integration, making it easy yep. to integrate in that infrastructure. Um, we're seeing more development in that arena as well. Um, but yeah, that's all Good. I got. Dave, last word. So I'm going to disagree with Oracle Dave a little bit. And I think that one of the, I'm Foundation Dave, he's Oracle Dave. We decided before. I think that one of the biggest lasting legacies of this whole NoSQL little adventure that we're on here is going to be that developers want different APIs for different problems. The, the idea of polyglot persistence, of wanting a simple API to do a task queue, if you just have a simple task queue, is something that's, that's going to be on. Go, I mean, that's, that's the legacy, I think. Um, and I don't think that things are going to converge to SQL. I, I think that SQL is going to continue to exist because it is an excellent, an excellent, excellent query language for a, a variety of tasks. But there's a huge demand for things other than SQL. I think that the most important thing coming to the NoSQL world right now is transactions. I think that's been the biggest thing lacking from the NoSQL products that have existed over the past few years. And I just spent four years at FoundationDB building a product to attack that problem. So I think it's the most important thing. All right, great. Well, let me check in with you now that you've heard the, the panelists a little bit here. Do you have any questions or follow-up questions for them? Let's start right here. Um, what are some of the factors that are hindering enterprises from putting their sensitive information into no SQL that is in the cloud? And what are some of the security trends that are causing some of these problems? Okay. Factors inhibiting no SQL coming into enterprises and into the cloud, uh, and especially in regards to security. Anybody want to pick that one up? <clears throat> um, I, I think um, one of the keys is the the lack of rich security models in the in the products today, right? You know, you you, you just can't build that kind of that kind of stuff overnight. You know, the the relational database folks they've been around for ever. You know, that's that technology and those features have been built over the last 25 years. You know, 
cell cell based security you know rich authorization and authentication models so um, I think I think the NoSQL products will get there it's just going to take time yeah, I think, go ahead I think you partially answered your own question as you asked it which is the, the cloud is a big problem <laughs> for for sensitive information mm. and one of the big challenges especially I'll talk about a class of enterprises that we speak to sometimes, ISVs who are developing an application. And one of the big challenges is that they've been used to delivering a product on-premise to their customers. And the back end was part of that product. Well, they now have this challenge where half of their customers are saying, well, keep shipping it to us because we want to own the information in our own data center. And the other half of their customers are saying, could you host this for us? You know, we don't want to host this ourselves. It's sort of annoying. And this is a huge challenge in terms of back end, because now you need to have a back end that can both run in the cloud in a multi-tenanted infrastructure and also run on premise at a customer. And so finding a good solution to that is, is a real challenge, and I think it's preventing a lot of people from, from adopting it. Okay. Uh, Pete, unless you have something quick, I was going to go on. Go ahead. Well, no, I was just thinking some of these NoSQL solutions are relatively new, and MarkLogic has been around for several years, so we've had transactions. We're ACID compliant. We've, we have role-based security, support FIPS 120 SSL. Um, there's, um, so when I, I just want to bring that to attention because I just don't want to be, we put all the, everything in the NoSQL bucket, right? And, 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 it's, and not all are, have the same history or investment that's put, been put into them. And uh, with regards to the cloud, there's the sensitivity of information. There's also the, also the elasticity. That's also who's providing your cloud. I work with Amazon. It's not the fastest machine <laughs> cloud infrastructure out there, right? So there's, uh, there's, there's different costs, not even the technology, but your Amazon investment that you're willing to make there, right? And, um, and yeah, you know, I, I think what we're seeing at MarkLogic is people have been looking at the open source solutions, but now they're coming to MarkLogic because we do have high availability, disaster recovery, backup. These are the things you expect out of an enterprise database, consistency and different ways to, yeah. you know, when it comes to governance and compliance and your single source of the truth, there's certain things you expect in an enterprise database, right? And, um, and maybe that's why those other technologies aren't being adopted, right? So. Is NoSQL a precursor to a whole lot more open source coming into the enterprise? Anybody? Um, I would say, yeah, you know, if, if the VC community keeps, um, you know, uh, investing in, in rounds of funding, um, you know, one, thing, one data point that I always think about is, you know, there's, there's been only one Red Hat. Right. So, and there's been a lot of open source. It's a very, very challenging business model, um, as you could imagine, right? Um, you know, developers aren't cheap. Um, people want to get paid. Um, and, uh, you know, do the math, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, I think it's inevitable. One thing that open source is, is great at doing is, um, is copying, right? When, when, when a product is laid out in front of you of, of what it should do, and, and when, when a product stagnates, when a product category stagnates, I think that provides an especially big opportunity for open source to come in and, uh, and catch up because the product roadmap's laid out. Um, I think, and maybe I'm bad-mouthing open source here, I think it has a little bit harder time innovating. And there's a lot of innovation happening in open source NoSQL projects right now, and wherever things go though, whether it's closed source or open source or whatever, I do think it's inevitable that there'll be an open source effort to build a version of that functionality. But I think, I think it might not be likely to happen until things have settled down a little bit more. All right, let's go with you. Now you, yeah, yep.
is it Spark? Sparkle. Anybody on Sparkle? It's a great, great idea. So, uh, <laughs> no, yeah, so actually, uh, so the next release of Mark Logic, that's where we're investing in is semantics. And so that means the ability to load triples, model an RDF with a triple index. And getting back to standards, one of the languages we'll support is Sparkle 1.0 with some aspects of 1.1. So we don't have um, inference. That'll be some external service to start with, right? So, um, but, but, but right off the bat, you'll be able to load your triples, have them indexed. We're really excited, like I was saying, because right now you have separate triple stores and document databases. You don't have them all integrated in one system. So what kind of queries can you drive when you can look at those relationships in conjunction with full text search over documents, right? And so Sparkle is a standard. Um, you know, Mark Logic, our engineers sit on the committees, the W3C committees for XQuery, XML, Sparkle. Are you a plant? Because that was a great question. I love it. No, <laughs> no but, uh, oh, nice. So, uh, uh, but we're very excited about that, but Sparkle, but that's part of a, you know, we have a roadmap for the next three years where we're going to be building, where this is a serious investment. We're going to continue to invest in semantics over the next few years. Great. Uh, right here. We touched on that a little bit. The questions about data warehousing. Anything more to add? Data warehousing as a real-time platform with of, of analytics. Okay. Okay. How's it going to morph? Um, I, you know, I would say yes and no. Right. <laughs> the perfect answer. It depends. <laughs> right. um, yeah. No. And, and really, so. Um, you know, wh one of the things I really like, and uh, as a vision, uh, you know, Nathan Mars uh, uh, gave a talk earlier, and, and he's, you know, the inventor of Storm. If you look at the Storm architecture, basically real-time, streams-based, you know, uh, you know uh, parallel computation framework, very, very compelling for doing real-time analytics, you know, on a stream of data being produced, you know, by machine resources, right? <clears throat> so there's that, right? Um, easy to use? No, you gotta, you gotta write a bunch of code to make that happen, right? Predictive analytics, easy to do? No, you gotta, you have to find a data scientist that really understands um, a lot about statistics and data analysis to make that happen. Um, so I think, I think strides are gonna be made, I think especially on the real time side when you look at things like Storm, because I think that's very, that's very interesting. But I think um, on the other side, you know, taking data that's part of your enterprise, that is in your operational data stores, classic transaction data, and, and being able to run data warehouse type queries, and especially, you know, operational data store as well as any kind of NoSQL data stores, I think, I think that's still gonna be around for quite some time. Okay, let's get one last question. One last question. Who's got a last question? Okay. Any more DBAs? Uh, NoSQL systems right now are pretty hard to run. So <laughs> the DBA is the person that's running the database. I think they'll be around for a long time. Guys? <clears throat> I'll actually answer your question with a question. Will we ever be able to solve the out of disk space error? DBAs will increasingly work for the cloud providers. I, mean, I know Oracle has been a promoter of a self-healing database or self-absorption database. That, that's a panacea, yes, absolutely. Are you going to get DBAs? Pete, uh, <laughs> I, I think it's the evolution. I think there's always going to be a, a need for DBAs, but what those DBAs do, you know, I think because we're seeing the evolution of the data warehouse. I was thinking of a paper by Greenclum called, back to your question, it's called Mad Analytics. And it talks about the characteristics of a next generation data warehouse. And um, I think a lot of those NoSQL solutions have those attributes of magnetic, agile, and deep. And so if anyone Googles that paper, it's an excellent paper. I'm not, I'm not sure I agree with their solution, but I like the characteristics they describe of the data warehouse. Um, but the, the DBA job is not going anywhere. 
right? Someone still has to, I just think there's actually gonna be more work because there's what we're seeing is more right tool, right job. Enterprises are more willing to bring in, you know, multiple systems if there's benefit, right? So they'll be learning new systems. It won't just be one with multiple databases. Now there'll be a Mark Logic and an Oracle and a Foundation and a Mongo and a whatever, you know, depending on what problem they're trying to solve. At least for the time being, till we evolve to the next level, right? So. And with that, we're out of time. Thank you all for your great questions and interest. Thank you, panelists.